Emily, thank you. That was really an incredible presentation, um, both in the way that it uh, recounts like a very um, intricate and complicated uh, history here in Hong Kong, um, and then also uh, beautifully advocates for uh, art criticism as being a very foundational activity and, uh, and crucial to a kind of ecology. Um, and I think this idea of ecology um, is such an important one. Um, you know, of course, that's why we're all here um, from our respective fields. That's why people come to Hong Kong uh, to see what is happening here, because there is a unique uh, ecology in the city, uh, and one that is definitely in flux and changing. Um, and but it's always important to remember um, the people who came before us, and also the ways in which, you know, w we are influencing the future. You know, and, and in order to really understand that, of course, we have to be reminded um, of our past, even if it's a past that we didn't participate in or we don't know about. Um, we're still connected to those people and those practices. So really, thank you, Emily. Um, so with me on stage, I'll introduce our other three panelists. Um, on the far right is Daniel Ho, um, who is um, the editor at Daigun and also the uh, director of the Art Book Fair uh, launched last year uh, called Booked, which is um, a new platform. Um, and maybe something we can talk about is um, the rise of the Art Book Fair. Uh, which has uh, become uh, quite an interesting and important platform uh, around the world, but also uh, across Asia uh, for dissemination of zines and art criticism and uh, different kinds of expanded practice. And uh, Nick Yu of uh, Blind Spot Gallery, um, also a writer in his own respect, uh, both in his work at Blind Spot Gallery, but also for other publications. And then Yolanda Blair, uh, curator of Moving Image from M+. But, but maybe I'll um, start by asking all of you to talk a little bit about how um, art writing figures into your own respective uh, fields on a kind of professional day-to-day uh, -day basis. Daniel, do you want to start? Just briefly, I mean, you know, average week, like how much are you reading? Um, you know, how much time in the office or in your outside of the office are you uh, reading about art and what are the kind of platforms that you consume? Uh -huh. um, okay, well... I, I think maybe, I think one of the questions is actually, sorry to answer with another question, but um, it's it's actually, I'm just also wondering, like art criticism and art writing. And I, th I think for some of us working in institutions or there's, because obviously we read and also produce a lot of art writing as a, you know, either educational mission or in relations with media, like press releases. I mean, that's obviously something a little bit different, but art criticism, as text also, you know, enters into a whole kind of larger field of writing about art, or it could be promotional, it could be educational. Um, for me, I guess, oof, it really depends. Sometimes I feel like I'm reading more Excel sheets and PowerPoints, and then on other weeks, good weeks, I uh, actually can kind of like wander and research and like, you know, look at different things. I mean, I, I read the standard whatever, you know, like Art Forum, Freeze, Ocula, Moose, Etc. 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 I try to keep up with uh, some of the, you know, local uh, art writing as well as whatever pops up on WeChat, you know, on the mainline. So yeah, I mean, I I can't give you a number. Some weeks it could be a, as little as like almost nothing, and then some weeks is, yeah, I'm reading a lot, you know. So thanks, Nick. Do you want to maybe talk about it? From uh, as someone who primarily works in a gallery, do you feel like your habits are a little bit different maybe than Daniel or? Similarly, sporadic. Sure. Um, so, as a gallerist, um, I am in charge of artist liaison and also um, liaising with, you know, press um, and collectors. Um, so, um, it is it, it is part of my job to actually monitor um, um, how um, how the gallery's represented artists are covered and are. Um, commented on um, in different art magazines and in not, not just art magazines but you know also um, you know newspapers locally and also internationally so um, I have set you know countless Google alerts on you know with keywords you know talk you know uh, keywording you know our, our artist names and you know I spent every day just kind of going through that and you know um, most of them are not that interesting 
um, and and I skim through them, but you know, from time to time, there are some very interesting articles or writers. Um, you know, so I would spend some time looking through them, um, deciding whether to put them onto our website, whether to share them on social media, whether to share them with my team, with my other collectors, with you know other stakeholders in the artist um, career. Um, I also spend some time, you know, kind of talking to other art writers, and you know, uh, a lot of them are my friends, and you know, we're in the same social circle, um, and really discussing, you know, um, some of these articles and. And, 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 and their positionality and why they're written in a certain way. Ilana, maybe you also could talk about, about um, how kind of existing writing maybe feeds into some of the writing that you do also from an institutional perspective. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess I've been thinking about this topic from various perspectives, both, I guess, from my own practice. Um, for me, uh, I guess, Curating and writing in many ways, uh, or curating and art writing in many ways is one and the same. Like um, the skills or the ways that I think about um, curating exhibitions or collections um, draws on the same kind of thinking, a lot of the thinking that um, Emily outlined in terms of thinking about an artworks. Um, kind of contextual importance, formal importance, um, conceptual importance. Um, so personally, I guess my own curatorial practice is very much informed by um, uh, yeah, art writing. Um, but thinking f more broadly as a, uh, from the perspective of the institution, um, I think we uh, are all thinking about ways in which we can support and open up space for art criticism um, and yeah, critical discourse. Uh, uh, within the museum, um, through whether it's symposiums or through our own publishing activities, um, both online and off. Uh, and then, of course, yes, there's the um, kind of reading uh, and talking uh, that I do um, of other people's uh, uh, art criticism and, uh, and, and writing. Um, and yeah, that for me as a moving image curator, I'm um, consuming a lot of um, visual art, contemporary art um, writing, but also I need to be looking at cinema. Um, and I really appreciated um, Emily talking about um, the very important work that's come before. And uh, we've been looking at, yeah, like the Phoenix Cine Club, and I've actually just recently acquired an important archive of their work. Um, looking at the work of Videotage has been so incredibly important. So. Um, yeah, I guess a long-winded way of saying that uh, yeah, art criticism plays a, an incredibly important role in um, in my work. And then Emily, maybe um, also, even though <laughs> even we've heard you talk already, but um, it would be interesting also just for you to say a little bit about um, maybe how you teach art criticism, as I know you've done, and uh, kind of maybe how students have been receptive to it, or um, what the sort of on level of understanding uh, you've encountered, let's say, among a less professionalized crowd? Um, I think that what is most exciting to students and to myself, actually, <laughs> is a lot of the experiments with fiction and art criticism. And um, I think students respond to that actually the most. It's the material that they enjoy reading the most because, um, so writers like Raphael Rubinstein or um, also, uh, uh, Lynn Tillman, um, even Chris Krauss. So uh, Chris Krauss's work is is very narrative based. It's maybe less fictional uh, explicitly, but uh, <laughs> it's much more personal. But um, but I, I would say that the reason for that is also because of the pressure of feeling that you have to know a truth about the art that you're looking at in order to be able to have a relationship with it. And I think that that's something quite problematic that 
I, I've seen a lot of Hong Kong art critics and art writers and practitioners uh, in the field trying to work against that. So I, I could speak actually to one particular art um, exercise that I did with Jeff Leung from our um, Art Appraisal Club, who came to, uh, to, to SCAD uh, for uh, the art criticism graduate course that I was teaching. And we have a collection of uh, student and uh, alumni and faculty work that we have throughout our campus, um, which also I'd like to invite those of you who are here today, if you would like to come for a visit to uh, our campus at SCAD Hong Kong, um, I'd love to give you my card and, and to host you to come by for a visit to see our, our campus. But in any case, uh, Jeff was very excited about this collection we have throughout the building, the North Kowloon Magistracy. Uh, that we inhabit. And um, he invited the students to do an exercise with post-it notes, where it was a very structured exercise, initially using just uh, verbs, then adjectives um, to describe what the students were seeing or feeling from the work, and then eventually to construct actually a story that was inspired by these verbs and adjectives. So that wasn't actually aimed at necessarily interpreting the work the way that we think that interpretation should function. And this was an amazing exercise. It was really beautiful to see how much it opened uh, so much thinking and so much reflection actually also on context and on material that otherwise is really actually kind of very difficult to pull when you're educating <laughs> to try to get the descriptive language um, coming out of the of, of people who are trying to train themselves to become uh, writers. Um, so I think that this kind of exercise that fictionalizes around work was the most compelling that I that I saw for students. What students hated was anything that was methodological, right? Like you know, some students who were very special got very excited about learning deconstruction and, <laughs> uh, but most of the students, right, they, they actually really resisted that. And I think that that tells us something, right, about these kinds of theoretical frameworks and maybe how they oppress art sometimes, <laughs> right? And maybe want to use the art to generate its own, right, theoretical framework, so. Yeah, I mean, that, um I have to respond a little bit to that last point because I often feel um, this tension between uh, the ways in which you know art criticism, like as a practice, or even just let's just say art writing, like writing about art. There's this big tension between over determining and maybe even over professionalizing, um, like the space of art, um, and maybe over describing it to the point where it kind of suffocates. Uh, practices, experiences, ambiguities, um, confusions. Um, to, yeah, and then, so on the one hand, of course, when people are writing about art, I mean, on the one hand, you want to share, and you also want to maybe open up understandings, but you're also, in describing, you know, also can uh, over-determine things, you know, and over-determining happens just through constraints, like constraints of time, constraints of space. Uh, you know, you can't write 10,000 words about every artwork, even though, you know, even 10,000 words might not be adequate in certain cases. So there is always this tension between how writing about art can be open up things and possibilities and also close things. Right. Um, so, but I, I wanted to ask you all this a little bit like how you find art writing uh, to be like useful or uh, yeah, how you kind of deal with criticism as it arrives to you. Like, and also from your sort of respective professional positions, like say Daniel, like at Daigun, like when people are writing about exhibitions at Daigun, like what kinds of things are kind of helpful for the institution um, and what kinds of things are frankly not helpful? This is recorded, so um, <laughs> I I will save my saucy comments later. Um, I think I think um, what what's helpful for an institution? I mean, yeah, I mean, criticizing a show is helpful for an institution, um, but I think that, it's, that that's a really different difficult question. I mean, I, I would say if an institution 
let's say not just tycoon, but hypothetically institutions in general, you know, make a major, you know, policy mistake or whatever. Yeah, I should be called out, you know, the, uh, 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 or I, I, th I think though, I think sometimes honestly though, um, again, I think not just speaking about what I'm experiencing uh, at tycoon or what I see at tycoon, but um, more generally just talking to a lot of people, I think, Often, sometimes people in institutions really experience a show quite differently from the visitor. And actually, to be honest, I, I, I'm not the curator at a, a lot of shows at Tycoon, so I'm going to say this from a third party, third kind of person perspective. But I actually feel like a lot of people, as curators or on the curatorial team, they, they just can't see the show in the same way. Actually, uh, they're so invested in it, and. Honestly, I think reviews are not very helpful for them because they're s starting from such a different point and looking at it so differently. They just, if, if someone criticizes them, uh, more likely they're just going to resist. You know, like it's very unlikely that they, they they gain that insight. But I think for 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 fellow, you know, as a viewer, yeah, it's interesting to. I think what I like in art writing, either as you know, I, I, I guess of exhibition goer, but also when, when when you want to do research, is it's great to have a sense of how some things are perceived. So, like, especially if you look historically, you know, sometimes it is nice to have judgment in reviews or uh, examples of how people perceive something because sometimes that shifts over time, and that's interesting. You know, uh, maybe art historically. Uh, what's nice is. Uh, when the writer, you know, digs up something that's not immediately apparent, you know, maybe it's not even written about in in whatever catalog or, or something like something that reveals something about the artwork or the artist. That's really helpful. I mean, I think it's important. I just want to say that um, you know, art criticism is often considered this like first draft of history. This is like one of the things that people say about it. But I, I would. I always think that's uh, a misnomer because there's already like every time you see an exhibition, somebody has already written about an exhibition. So, and you almost never walk into a museum or gallery space and then like, you know, have no text accompaniment. I mean, there's usually a wall text, a brochure, wall labels. You know, so everything has already been written about. So, in a way, art criticism is kind of like the response to not only the text that exists already, but also then all of the works. You know, it's a kind of, uh, it's almost like a second draft, like uh, uh, with some additional comments in the margins, basically. Um, Nick, how do you feel about that uh, from a gallery perspective? Like, you started to talk a little bit about things you do and do not share, um, you know, the things that are good. And so what is good uh, for from a gallery perspective? Like, what kind of writing do you, would you put on your website or would you share with your colleagues or with the artists versus the kind that you just dismiss? Right. Um, so I think when, whenever, whenever we, whenever our shows or our artist shows are covered, you know, in, in, in art writing, um, it's all, it always brings a great sense of acknowledgement. And I think that sense of acknowledgement is very important, especially coming from, you know, like a, like like a mid-sized gallery like blind spot you know like we our exhibitions don't have the kind of clout or the kind of uh, influence or talked about kind of um buzz that you know in, uh, that institutions like you know amplas or tycoon enjoy right you know so so we we, we do spend we, we do try different ways to kind of get people's attention right so the fact that you know we uh, our show is covered, you know, by 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 someone um, is already a great sense of acknowledgement, and it 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 really pushes our conversation forward. Um, um, the the reviews that I that you know that that are particularly valued are the ones that, uh, as Daniel said, you know, kind of add to you know um, the already written text about uh, uh, about the show. Uh, in the case of uh, you know, a gallery show. I mean, I, I write the press release, uh, both in English and Chinese, um, and you know, my colleagues send them out to you know the press. So um, it's it's pretty obvious when when um, a, a so-called review is just a re recapitulation of uh, your press release, <laughs> you know, um, and it's and it really doesn't add that much. You know, it's just kind of a, an exercise in copy and pasting. I mean, still, you know, it acknowledges the show, right? Um, 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 uh, um, but 
it, it, it doesn't add to the conversation, right? Um, um, the reviews that I enjoy the most are the ones who, you know, like, are, are from writers who, you know, like, really had a conversation with you, the gallerist or the artist. Um, you know, they really kind of dug deeper into, into um, the artworks or, you know, performed the kind of contextual or conceptual analysis that we talked about. Um, um, and, 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 and I think these reviews are very interesting because even as a gallerist, I rely on them, especially the ones, you know, let, let's say if I was researching on an artist, um, a potential artist um, whom I'd be interested to collaborate with, um, you know, I would, I would really look into some of the older you know, um, you know, some some of the the, the earlier um, shows and look at how they were received by different writers. And it's often very interesting to see, let's say, the same writer from the same magazine uh, to write a re review of that artist's show, but you know, two or three years apart. And you you could really see uh, their 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 career development or you know their artistic voice being nurtured and and, and being changed um, and responding to what's happening. Um, so. So, 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 so I think that's these. These are the reviews that I find most kind of endearing, and these are the ones that I would pay the most attention to. Yolanda, as a practicing curator, um, how have you over the years like developed a relationship to people writing about projects that you've worked on, and you know, has it been helpful for you, or, um, as, or are you in the sort of model that Daniel describes, where you know you don't recognize your own image when it's yeah written about. I think I I have I feel ambivalent. Um, on the one hand, uh, I guess one I, th I think um, underlying issue is a writer's um, proximity or distance um, to you as a curator, to the artists, to the process of making the show. Um, I think uh, some writers, cur uh, critics. Um, prefer to have this kind of so-called, um, you know, objective critical distance from um, the work that and thinking that's gone into uh, the making of a project, um, which can sometimes be um, really kind of enlightening um, to have somebody come in as this like kind of outside eye, I guess, um, yeah, sort of analysing, interrogating um, the project from a yeah, from a sort of distance. Um, there are issues, I think, in this day and age, in the age of um, social media, um, when misinformation can kind of spread like wildfire and get um, perpetuated and, um, uh, you know, that I think is an, uh, some, sometimes an issue. Um, but, yeah, by and large, I love the process um, of talking to writers and... Um, having yeah others um push my thinking push my ideas um and yeah generally i i, I guess i i very much welcome um that kind of discourse and yeah i think um when it's good um art criticism is you know an agent of change and can um yeah, really uh, open up and influence um, the kinds of uh, work that's done yeah, in the future. Emily, do you want to chime in about this idea about pr uh, proximity and distance? I mean, maybe also in your own kind of hybrid practice, let's say, like if you were going to write about a show, like how much distance do you try to maintain? Or if you're writing about an artist's practice, like are you do you want to be very involved and really understand and like let's say either the curator's perspective or the artist's perspective or do you just want to have your own experience and uh, yeah maintain a kind of objective distance um i think uh, i like to engage in all of those <laughs> Uh, and so I try to compartmentalize maybe the way, like, I, and I try to plan out how I'm going to see something. So, and I do this also with with students, where um, I really try to encourage. I, I tell, actually, forbid them to read any exhibition literature when we go initially to visit shows when it's the beginning of the class, um, because I feel that otherwise, what happens is again because they're af afraid of saying the wrong thing. And they think that there is a truth that's, that's there that, uh, that they don't have access to. 
that I find that if I, I do that, then they tend to engage much more with the work. And they do come up with really interesting thinking, and they have their own associations. And so once I go through that process with them, then um, eventually we start working maybe towards like the middle of a class or the end of the class with more uh, curatorial kind of literature, where they can learn how they can, they can relate to that literature, how they can think about it in relation to the ideas they've already formed. So I kind of go through that process myself as well. Um, but I always like listening to, to artists and hearing from artists about um, what it is that they're doing. But the artist's intent is also not necessarily always uh, <laughs> as for, you know from to, to quote Lukash it's it's not it's not right the intent of the object so the object also has its own intent and uh, work that it does and so I think that you have to take into consideration all of those those things um, I would like to say actually something about a practice that I think is really interesting not to focus so much on my friend Hera Chan but uh, I think part of the way that Hera has Hera Chan, uh, she she curated a show um, uh, for Bedroom uh, Gallery um, in in Prince Edward. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and in that show, she came up with a way of writing the curatorial text as a as a as a fiction. And uh, she's also done this before for other shows that she's curated. And I think it's, it's very effective because, and of course you can't always do that in every context, right? So you can't, it, a lot of times for major institutions, you can't do that, right? Um, but maybe there are, there are ways, right, of, of institutions can welcome in that kind of thinking so that the expectations about a curio curatorial text are not that this text is going to tell me everything that I need to know about the work and it's written by an expert and then I'm going to go look at it and see everything that the text told me and then leave. And that's my experience, right? So. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, points to one of the larger, uh, let's say, issues that the Hong Kong and also the world's art scenes, frankly, face, which is there's there's a kind of formula, uh, a very professionalized set of practices that you know everybody who works in the art field n knows professionally. I mean, and we have points of reference for all of these practices, whether it's various kinds of museum practices or like formulas for art magazines and things like this. But then it's a, there's this big question about like whether to replicate them, you know, or whether to try to deviate and like create something new and you know or you know it's a little bit like an alternative space kind of model like okay we don't want to run a museum but we want to do something different but how do we do it right yeah. you know i think that's that's a, it's a hard to have that expectation of a major institution and that's the reason why we have other kinds of spaces because that's those other spaces where you can do those kinds of things um also i would say like something that i learned from uh, another writer that I didn't usually do that much before um, is talking to guards. And I learned this actually from my friend Ingrid Chu, who does that, uh, has, has done that a number of times in a number of her uh, pieces of writing. So I think I became more interested in, in, even I've talked to guards, but I haven't necessarily brought in, or at gallery attendants brought in the way they think about the shows into my reviews. But I've started doing that a little bit inspired by <laughs> inspired by by her practice and I, I would say I have a piece that I'm working on that I've been working on for the past year that's about a very close friend of mine um, an artist Italian performance artist Chiara Fumai um, who uh, committed suicide in 2017 and um, I that's something that where you're talking about proximity that's something that I, I feel have struggled a lot with figuring out how to write about it in a way that will be publishable because it's so personal. And yet at the same time, I think a lot of the things that I, I would like to say are, are somehow I feel compelled to say them. Um, and, and so I think that's something that I've been working on for the past around year, year and a half, trying to figure out. And I haven't quite, I think, yet found <laughs> the way of doing it. So a lot of writing, trying to just keep doing it, sending it out, getting back kind of responses and figuring out how to reshape it and rethink it. And, I actually, yeah. yeah so I, I mean, I want to go back a little bit about the distance of the writer too. I mean, I think there's a, probably a few things, but one, yeah, sure. There's there's a sense of like an artist creates a work; it doesn't have a you know unique meaning, you know, death of the author kind of thing. Like, yeah, the visitor comes in, and you know, 
has a different interpretation, different associations. But I think what's interesting working in an institution, though, is I realize how much the meaning is unintentional sometimes. And uh, there's like mishaps, works being not able to be shipped, and then the show looks different, or material being chosen. Like, I, and, and to be honest, I, I would say like, there's a lot of accidents in, in exhibition making. I mean, there's a lot of like contingent aspects when you actually put a show together, and there are choices you make that have nothing to do with artistic intention, you know? And then how does this get read by the, the, the visitor? I mean, and, and this is valid that the visitor or viewer should read it, and that should be taken into consideration, but then your the writer's position with whoever's curating, or the knowledge, the, the insider knowledge of however uh, whatever mishaps that led to whatever choices. I mean, how do you even write about that, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you, should should that even be conveyed? Oh, well, so this exhibition is really empty because we actually couldn't ship three works, you know? Or do you not say that? And then you just say, well, it just creates a sense of blah, 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 you know? I think, and, and yeah, you could respond to that. But I think two, two is like, I think I'm writing a lot less, but like, Honestly, making exhibitions or being a part of a team that makes exhibitions makes me look at writing completely differently now. Uh, and, and makes me look at shows, sorry, exhibitions completely differently. Yeah. Um, what about uh, social media and like younger generations? I mean, we, Emily pointed to this a little bit, and I completely agree like that the, there's not a crisis in art criticism, there's just a crisis in reading and like the popular. Uh, and public culture of conversation based on things that we've read has completely been shifted by the way that we uh, consume information. So now that most of our reading is done through kind of short form social media posts, uh, or maybe, I mean, and a lot of the time it's not even reading, it's just images. Um, yeah, I mean, how is it sort of affecting like what is being written about art or the way that it's consumed, and you know, how do institutions or galleries? Think, uh, how are you thinking about that? It's and actually, it, it's yeah. actually interesting because there is a. I think her name is Samantha Frost. She's an author who she was. She actually wrote this book in Hong Kong while she was at City U. She wrote a book that's about, it's called, I think, Art Criticism and Online History, or Art Criticism Online, a History, something like that. And so I think that, and she makes, I think, really interesting, um, over, gives, a, gives, a, gives an understanding of, she doesn't really give an overview, right, of it, but she tries to give a deeper understanding of what that means. It's not just necessarily social media, but it's other kinds of um, the way text is being exchanged uh, previously. Um, but I think I think uh, the reason why I bring her up is because her text really ends with talking about um, making this statement about how uh, it's not that it, doing research on art criticism online meant literally, right, as it being on the internet, right? really made her reflect, I think, on this idea of art criticism as being something that's um, expanding, right? That not rather than contracting, rather than there being a paucity of or lacking of, it's something that it's taking on other forms that we like just don't recognize yet and we're not naming. And um, she doesn't necessarily put it like that, but she, it's kind of the concluding note of her, of her book. Um, and I think it's interesting and not accidental that she was writing that in Hong Kong. <laughs> so. um, when it comes to social media, um, and, and I guess not just social media in general, but you know blogs or you know um, you know internet, where where it is much nowadays much easier to publish an opinion about about a show or uh, about anything. You know, in general, about politics, about you know, personal relationships, about your cab driver, or you know, your restaurant. Uh, everyone is a, could be a critic nowadays, and and in a way, that's how a lot of the kind of user generated contents from, you know, um, Yelp or you know, a lot of these um, kind of apps come from, right? But then I see that you know, with a rise in kind of authorship and just kind of you know, p access to publishing. Um, there's also a decline, not just in readership that we talked about, but also a decline in kind of ad editorship. You know, uh, the the ability and 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 the and the will to be editing your own text or editing other people's text, 
right? Um, and and I, I I do see that in, for example, in in, in, in let's say you know uh, a, a review that we just received, you know, uh, for, for one of our shows, and it, it was a it was a negative review. Uh, but then if you read through the review, you would see that, you know, the writer probably had a really bad day, you know, and really the writer came to the gallery and like, you know, um, no, things are not working and she almost stepped on like a, like a cockroach, which is like an artwork. Um, and then, and, 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 and then just, you know, mishaps and this and that, and that really informed, you know, the tone of, uh, and the content, right, of, of, of her review. But then, you know, if, let's say, she had the time to work this through with an editor, whether the editor is herself or, you know, someone in her team, then, you know, the writer could realize that, you know, oh, you know, maybe that is, or, or maybe a therapist. Um, <laughs> Editors are sometimes therapists. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. Okay. Um, um, then, you know, the review might take a different form that might be more constructive and substantial. Yes. I mean, maybe the crisis, uh, perceived crisis of art criticism among writers is just a, a, a secondary effect of an expanding art world that's reaching much larger audiences. I mean, it might be a very particular, smaller world where people talked in a particular language to one another. Uh, whereas, like you know, you have institutions that have reaching way, way, way more people than before, uh, and you're just a, the way that people talk about it isn't in the normal perceived, you know, standards of the art world. You know, it, it's just being expanded to a, a much larger field, right? So maybe that's it. You know, so. Oh, I mean, I, going back. To, sorry, Yolanda, do you want to say something about the, the frame? All I was going to say is that um, I guess in this kind of information age when there is um, just so much writing and so much information um, circulating in the world, I don't have um, an issue with that so long as we are having so long as that um, offer is um, multifaceted, which I think it, it still is. I mean, I think there are still places to find um, long form writing. I think that has um, uh, there are places to find, you know, very short, pithy, but um, maybe succinct um, uh, opinions and um, critical voices that are worthwhile. Um, what am I trying to say here? That there are different ways that we can come to uh, interpret and think about um, art through writing. And there are so many different ways that writers are working. Um, and I think there is... It, it, it's a, yeah, it's an ecology, and there are um, uh, there there are many different um, uh, ways to think about um, the place of criticism and uh, some uh, and yeah. I, am I am I making sense? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> I don't definitely. think so. Um, definitely. And when I was just going to say that that in a way uh, relates nicely to what Emily was saying earlier in the in her presentation by just reminding us that you know art criticism is a kind of practice and is very embedded in the kind of structures of not only a place but also the institutions. So it, it works in relationship to both kinds of technologies but also platforms that exist and as part of this ecology. I don't uh, want to deprive our audience of the opportunity to ask questions of the panelists, wonderful panelists here, if you have questions about or comments. I see one hand in the front. <laughs> yeah. Oh, OK. Sorry. Um, I want to say thanks to everyone, um, all of the panelists, and, and to Emily for a presentation that I think was uh, hugely valuable. Um, I think it's. A, I think the importance of, of art writing, art criticism, however we call it, um, is is uh, uh, extremely important um, to how the art world functions and how people understand art and approach it. Um, and and uh, I just think everyone is fantastic, and the work that you guys do, and and how you how you use art criticism and, and what you do is is um, e extremely important. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of. Uh, speak to the importance of art criticism from the perspective of, of a gallerist um, and, and what it can do for galleries in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think why part of why we wanted to have this conversation um, at the Art Gallery Association's yearly kind of symposium. And it's because 
art criticism really can make or break shows for us in terms of selling, which is one aspect of this kind of production line that Emily, you talked about, and also the environment at large. Um, I, for example, have had literally a museum contact me being like, do you have the artwork on the cover of this magazine, right? Or of this, of this art publication, because that's what I want to collect. Right, um, and so things like that happen and have a direct effect, um, and we also feel it on the other side. Right, when when things are negative, when somebody writes a review that is critical of our show, and then maybe things don't sell as much or don't sell at all, and we're like, oh, you know, that that, that it's all that review, right? Um, I think it's I think it's important that we uh, uh, have some sort of um, understanding as gallerists that that this is all part of like a larger process um, where we're, we're learning and 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 try to take these criticisms um, in stride uh, in, in a certain way and and I was I guess wondering if, if um, maybe Nick you in particular as as the gallerist on stage might want to speak to um, an instance where perhaps a critical review was something you 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 positively took away something from um, and, and, and had a moment to reflect on in, in, in a way that was more than just, um, you know, being upset, basically. Uh, can I first say something? I mean, I think that uh, if we were to be really simplistic about this, the some of the best-selling artists in the world are also the ones that are most often reviewed negatively, so and are in some ways the worst artists in the world. Um, so, I, I mean, if you were to look at the say critical feedback, uh, so which I think just points to the fact that you know, I think like any kind of writing about exhibitions or artists, you know, it just boosts their visibility. So I would assume from um, commercial side that, you know, even a negative review at least brings it to th their attention. But yeah, so maybe I'm that actually... review wasn't bad enough. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. That's why it didn't sell. Thank you. <laughs> But, sorry, I mean, when you talk about a cover magazine, it means like the art forms, art edit, the art director has a lot of power then, you know? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think Willem pointed to a very important and prescient point, right, about, about kind of the productive, productive, product, economic aspect of, of um, you know, articles in art magazines. Um, I, uh, uh, although I, I, I might cast a bit of doubt on like the kind of direct cost, cost and effect of like a good piece of review and what it does to your sales and whether a bad review really makes it bad or whether it's merely a kind of correlation between, uh, among many different factors. Um, you know, I've ha like, you know, I, I've had shows that are really well covered and then the sales are, like are, are decent, but you know, or not like through the roof. And then you know, we do have shows that are, that are not that well covered by the press, and it sells very well, perhaps because that show was more kind of commercial to start with, so it didn't have that much kind of art critical value. But then it had a lot of commercial value. Um, but then I, so so you, Willem wanted to ask uh, to wanted me to give an example of like, like a positive review, um, and. Uh, and and how it affected right uh, sales and it, 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 it not not sales in particular but in my mind there there's one instant when um, when um, it was a show it was a show that that happened like two years ago and and um, sales at that time was like like decent but not like spectacular um, and then two years later. Um, like a collector, a new collector, just you know, walked up to you know, came to the gallery and said, "Hey, um, you know, I I want to know more about this show," um, and and it came out of the blue. You know, it was from such a long time ago. We just didn't quite register why. And then through our conversation, we realized that um, you know, the the collector kind of saw um, and read and kind of really started researching about our show because of that review from two years ago. You know, so so in in a way, there's this kind of futural kind of um, agency of of writing which is you know something that we shouldn't give up on right you know it reaches out into the future uh, and, and 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 affects you yeah i, I actually want to ask yolanda something <laughs> not to talk m plus specifically but in in your experience do you think museums acquisition decisions 
uh, can be affected by, let's say, a review or a piece of, you know, art magazine writing or whatever? Um, Short answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, yes, I think it can. Um, personally, I try to read as much as I can find about a particular um, artist practice or um, artwork when I'm doing my acquisitions research and. Um, Invariably, that will um, surface uh, many different opinions, um, perspectives, and um, I guess, it, yeah, other people's um, the conversations around a particular artwork are going to, uh, yeah, I think uh, affect my thinking around, uh, yeah, the value of that piece. Um, and when I say value, I obviously mean. Um, it's you know uh, value in the story of the collection that, and um, the history that we're uh, trying yeah talking about. Um, so yes, short answer. Thank you. I, we we should conclude there, but I will also just say that um, you know this com conversation is important to me also because it just is nice to be reminded that uh, other institutions um, and galleries and um, you know even. Uh, in the academic world, that it's still like an important uh, kind of practice uh, that art criticism and writing about art is still very central to what we do. And uh, you know, I hope for all of us in our own ways that we can continue to nurture like different forms, different platforms, and different voices, uh, younger voices or older doesn't really matter, but uh, to basically keep up the conversation. So, and with that, we'll. Um, continue the conversation uh, off the stage or around. So thank you, uh, Daniel, Nick, Yolanda, and Emily for a beautiful presentation. So thank you. <laughs>